this is part three of casting out demons and spiritual authority. And I admit last week, I tried to pump a little bit too much in, in, uh, in one small session. But we'll just sort of round it out uh, tonight, hopefully. But if we don't get it, then we'll just, you know, continue on. We're going to get this thing because it's very important right now. And the, the key scripture is, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. That is an incredibly powerful statement because it talks very clearly that, first of all, the finger of God we know is what? The Holy Spirit, right? So Jesus cast, was casting out demons by the Holy Spirit. And he says, look, what am I showing you here? I am showing you that the kingdom of God is being manifest. That we've been given power over the darkness in this world. And I have come to show you that this is a measure of the power that we have over that darkness. So when he did it, he did it to establish that do dominion and then to give it to us. So how we use that? Have we done well with it? You see the problem. This is a, so as we've gone through this Passover season, you feel that there's been a line drawn and that all of a sudden now deliverance and the, the fight is, is before us and we've got to choose whether or not we're gonna cross the Jordan to take the land or whether we're going to write some more manna cookbooks and circle them out in a few more times in the wilderness. Because the destiny of the church is supposed to be to take the land. And it had to be taken. But we've been given authority and power to do certain things. But have we operated in it? And that's the question. So there a, was a movie, Monday and Tuesday, come out in Jesus' name. And it says it's the most important awakening in church history has begun. And it very well could be. Because if this wakes up the church to take their role, because we understand that Jesus came the first time and he did not take out the Romans. What he did, though, was he demonstrated authority and power at the individual level to set people free. And he gave us authority but he also gave us authority over the works of the devil. Now, are we going to be able to destroy the devil? No. But can we destroy the works of the devil? Yes. So if this is truly an awakening to who we are, this is the key right now that, that we must grab hold of because this is our moment. And you can feel the shift. Don't miss this opportunity to cross the Jordan. Otherwise, you, you, you may perish in the wilderness. After all, our generation is just about to do that. But we do have some Joshua and Caleb's Amen. <laughs> who believed then, even though they didn't see it at the time, we believed then. But yes, we had to wait for a while. But Joshua and Caleb crossed over and they led that generation over. And that is who I'm looking at right here, Joshua and Caleb's. But we've got to understand how to cross the Jordan and how to take down the giants on the other side. Because that's where our destiny lies. And that was the, the whole purpose of all of this. So I look at this situation, and I guess to me, I, I compare it to uh, the way this country was founded. We, we, basically, they had religious persecution, so they came over here and decided, we're going to worship God, and we're going to worship God freely. And they stood. And when they uh, built this country, they basically built it from the churches who stood as militia, and in, because there wasn't really a standing army at the time, and defended this nation and saying, no, we will not submit ourselves to a yoke of slavery or bondage again to a global world order. We will not do it. And so they stood and they wrote a constitution and they wrote a constitution declared that we would have freedom of speech and freedom of religion, the First Amendment. And that's what's important, right? We need this, our freedom. But there was a Second Amendment. Now, why do you think he gave us a Second Amendment? Why, why was that put into the Constitution? Could it be that without the Second Amendment, we were not able to hold the First Amendment? So, literally in the kingdom, 
Is this the Second Amendment? Do we have the right to bear arms in the Spirit? And if we don't, are we going to lose the freedoms of, of worship and religion? Are we going to lose the ability to tell the truth? So this is the spiritual Second Amendment. See, here about two weeks ago, we had Sheriff Reynolds, Frank Reynolds in here, to talk about the Second Amendment. And he was talking about the fact of, yes, he's the sheriff, he's an elected official here. But there's literally, we know that there's a Second Amendment which actually establishes a, a militia which is there to support the sheriff. And so, in other words, to defend this community for what? To protect the constitutional rights. And I'm looking at this thing and saying we need a Christian militia that basically is, has the right to bear arms, and these are the arms we need to bear. And so this is very, very important. Those who say, hey, I believe in the Second Amendment, and by the way, I do, totally. I also believe in this, that we need to be able to own our responsibility to stand against the works of the devil. So uh, a lot of you saw this movie, right? Can you feel that there's a shift going on? And the one thing I liked about the movie, I was surprised I watched it the second time, a lot of that movie was to the pastors. Did you notice that? Did you notice that he was showing the pastors that, hey, I remember he said that, he says, you know, I was very concerned when I got this about what would happen to my congregation if I go out there and start teaching all this stuff. I mean, it's just going to cause confusion and whatever. And then he says, God finally revealed to me that my congregation was ready. It was me that was the holdup. And so he started, and the cars lined up for miles. I mean, what does that tell you? They showed up. So there is a need here. And it's, but it can't be done by one person, and even one pastor. It's to be done by us out there. And that's what this is about tonight. I want to go through and just sort of finish up some details on this to prepare you for this. So... We've been talking about these things in this session, part one, two, and three. And I'm going to do a really quick review on the first part. What is evil? And I was talking about the three levels of evil. The first one is the one the church usually deals with. That's your own personal desires and getting yourself straight and, you know, don't mess with your secretary, don't do this, don't do that. All these things, you know, that basically guardrail sermons to keep you from doing anything really stupid. But it's all about you and your personal will. And that's where they believe that things are dealt with. But there's another level called demonic evil. And that's doing the things that you don't want to do. Do you want to commit suicide? Do you want drugs, alcohol? If you looked at those things and said, is this the way I want my life to go? No, those are not things. These are things that have a bondage over you. Unfortunately, I don't see a lot of churches dealing in that way with those things. And they may farm that out. And I think Greg Locke was saying, look, churches, this is our opportunity. The people are ready. They're looking for these things. We need to step up. But that's us. We need to step up. So that's the demonic evil. And then evil dominion. Evil dominion is the powers and principalities up there. That's the ones who really run things. That's who's in real charge. Now, Jesus came and established dominion. All authority, right? But in our world right now, dominion seems to be held by the devil. So we're in a fight at the personal level, but we're also in a fight at the, the full demonic level because if look at what's going on right now. This isn't a few bad people. This is a spiritual conspiracy. This is easily a battle between light and darkness, between the plans of the devil in the kingdom of God. So we need to operate in levels two and three. And right now the church has not crossed the line. They're still in the wilderness, most of them. And I'm not saying all of them. I'm glad to see a lot of them are moving forward. But a lot of them are still just stuck on number one. Your best life today. What is deliverance? Well, deliverance is to be freed from the spiritual bondage as it affects you physically, emotionally, spiritually, 
oppression, depression, sicknesses, mental torment, addictions, and many other things which you wouldn't choose for your life. They're things that have you. Demonic deliverance is demonstrated by Jesus as the casting out of demons. Demons are evil spirits. They have three main goals. Keep you in sin and bound up in a curse. To keep you away from knowing Jesus and to keep you distracted from fulfilling His purpose in your life. So if you have one of these three problems, you probably have a demonic problem. I understand if you don't want to do these things, but if you do and you're not, take a look at those things. I did a, a deliverance uh, frequently asked questions. We're not going to go into that. But basically, it's there so we can all agree on some basics that people need to know. So what is spiritual authority? We talked about that. Luke eleven twenty, 20, this, this, our key scripture. Dominion over the devil was established. That's what Jesus said. If I cast out demons with the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of darkness. And I have just proved it. Now I need you to prove it too. So then he says, and John, uh, well, John uh, said this about Jesus. He who sins is of the devil. In other words, the devil is the one who is the initiator of sin. But the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Didn't say destroy the devil, because he will do that. But he's charged us to do this, destroy the works of the devil. How are we doing on that? I think we, gotta, we haven't fulfilled it. And, and quite done yet? In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he's, Jesus came and spoke to them, last words, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore. I've established dominion. Make disciples of all nations. Disciples do what? Well, they do what he did baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So yes, we're out there baptizing people in the name of the Father. Sometimes we baptize them in Jesus. But how many times do we baptize them in the Holy Spirit? We need all three. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Do as I did. So there's a spiritual authority is not the physical authority. Spiritual authority is not obeying your pastor. It's obeying God. And it's standing up against the powers of the devil. To have spiritual authority, you must be able to walk in authority over the spiritual powers on this earth. That's spiritual authority. It has nothing to do with natural authority. So in all those things that you've read that's talking about spiritual authority and the hierarchy of the church, they're all wrong. I'm just saying it, plain out. It's about your power against the powers of darkness, which is about your relationship with Christ. And the ones with the, who knows who has the greatest spiritual authority in this room? More than likely, it's someone who's an intercessor that prays all the time. But you know it when you cast out demons. So part two was the key, was the weapons of our warfare. We walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. So it says, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. We have a spiritual power. And we have weapons that operate in those things. And they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So in other words, a stronghold is something that has people bound. It's a lie that they believe. And this basically says, we have weapons to destroy that. Because isn't that what an argument against the knowledge of God is? But it also says that we're to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That doesn't mean you're perfect obedience to God. What it means is submit to God and resist the devil. Your obedience is about submission to God and to accept his calling. And then you're to punish that disobedience, which means the lies that have been spoken out there. We're to be riding the ship, folks. That's what he empowered us to do, and it's what he told us to do. So I also listed a whole bunch of these weapons of our warfare, as I used to teach them, and as probably most of you do all of these. Now, the reason I highlighted the sun in blue is these are the ones 
that we're dealing with here in casting out demons. Uh, you don't need all of these, but they're tools that you have. They're weapons that you have. If you're a, 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 a law enforcement officer, you have certain weapons that you use, and you have certain tactics that you use. All those things are important. So if you look at them, you don't have to go, we're not going to go through them all, but they're basically pretty straightforward. They're things you're probably already doing, and yes, there is a page two of them. And yes, I've done all these, and most likely, you guys have done all these. So, but you need to just have this ability to go out and handle the situations out there. It's not that hard. It's not that difficult. It's just following the Spirit. So tonight, we're continuing on with the discussion on actual deliverance, casting out of a demons. And what I was laying forth and will continue to lay out here tonight is just a scenario of how to handle that ministry. So this is a list of, shall we say, the types of things that you do to set up this ministry for maximum success. If you were a law enforcement officer, then you probably have patterns that you go through and things that you've learned on how to handle dangerous situations to set them up to use the authority that you've been given. And that's all I'm talking about here is how to set up a situation where you can have victory over the enemy. You aren't always going to have the ability to set this up, but many times you do. And it basically is in three parts. The first part is the preparation. Preparing in prayer, praying in the Spirit, choosing to believe. That means really believing what you're doing and what He can do. If you don't get those parts right, I wouldn't go on to the next part. If you don't feel ready for that, so, and, but you can. You can simply prepare through prayer. And then you get into setting up the ministry situation. You usually begin with worship, song or two, whatever it takes to just settle in and allow the Holy Spirit to come and surround you. And you begin then to uh, minister as a team, listen to the Holy Spirit, and pray and prophesy. Now, what you're doing then is you're setting up an environment. And when you set up this environment, you're going to discuss with the person what it is. Now, maybe you're in some ministry line and people are coming up to you. Well, what's the first thing that you want to do? You want to basically set up a situation where you can talk to them about what the need is and let God talk in the situation. Well, I'm just saying this is a way that we, in general, will set this up. And then after that, how to lead the actual deliverance part. So the second part, you're actually going into the discussion, you're listening to them, and you're listening to God. And you're saying, what is going on here, Lord? What do, what do I see? So I believe in team ministry because I think it adds power, just like a law enforcement officer knows that he runs into something that someone who's armed, and that's our equivalent of a demon, they may call for backup. And the backup knows exactly what to do. So we can come together as a team. Last week, I talked about setting up that situation, ministering as a team. And I think that that's important. And what you usually do is form some sort of a, some sort of a circle that you can communicate and discuss. You can be with, you can have two, three, four, five, six people maybe. But whatever it is, I've got it down in chairs because I believe sitting in chairs is a lot better than standing up and trying to deal with spiritual situations. Make it comfortable, make it easy. And then you don't have to worry about a lot of other things that are distracting. So if you set up a little circle of prayer, which we all know how to do that for praying, I like to have the person that you're ministering to directly across from the lead. So you can just, whatever the situation is, you're directly across. Now, I've got a, a subject support there person, which often the subject likes someone with them for their support. So you include them in that discussion, right? If it's a kid, it'll be a parent. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's the person who brought them. But you include them in the discussion. And you have other ministers around. So you can form some sort of like a circle, standard prayer circle. Now notice I said a mixed team is usually best when ministering to an individual. Particularly if, uh, you know, if you're ministering to a woman, 
then you know, just a single man is probably not a good idea. You want women involved in that ministry also, because for, for lots of good reasons. One person at a time should lead the ministry. So when you're holding these discussions, you let one person be the lead. And that person knows how to include the others in that discussion and say, did you all get anything? Let's pray. And the Lord show us, you know, what's going on. Who, what are you guys hearing? And you ask them questions. This, if you set this up properly, you're setting up a situation for victory. Because if the demon controls this part, you don't go on to the second part. And let me tell you, they will do lots of things to control this. The two main things you'll run into are the emotional crying and all that other stuff. Most of that is just a distraction. I mean, it's like, it's not real. It's the spirits coming in and they're crying and they're this and that. A lot of time, that's not it at all. You got to get past that. And probably even worse is stories. People love to tell you their story. Demons love to talk about how, how they've had great victory in your life. And so if a person is running their story, you got to stop that. Because they're, they're literally rehearsing the, the bad situation. And I've done that many times where you say, wait a minute. Now, here's what I really need to know. Or what the Lord is showing me is this. But you can't let them take charge of the situation because you're giving control to the demon. Plain and simple. And so you've got to set this up right now and set up in the discussion the way that we're going to work this. And you've got ministers on either side of you and they can get words of knowledge. They can hear things. So all of this is coming together and you want to get a picture of the situation, sort of a three-dimensional view around what's going on here. Because the Holy Spirit is going to do a lot of the ministers. And the ministry, as a matter of fact, is doing all of it. But he'll work through you. And there's certain things that he wants to minister to in that time, and certain things are not ready yet. So you want to sort of follow what the Spirit is telling you. And if the Spirit says, don't do it, don't do it. Back off and say, um, no, I really can't, I don't think we're supposed to handle this at this time. Whatever it is, you've got to establish clarity in that situation. Discuss issues to receive clarity and discern what God is saying in the situation. Sometimes that can take a little bit of asking questions and it'll lead things to it. And you'll, the God will begin to paint a picture of what the real problem is. It's usually not something simple. It usually has a root to it. And sometimes you've got to deal with that. Unforgiveness, different things. And then let everyone come into agreement. So if you've got other people, other ministers, whatever, sort of begin to listen and you can swap off leadership at any time. You can take, one minister can come and says, you know, I'm getting this right here. Well, here, you come over and you swap seats and let them ask the questions. And then when they're finished, you, you come back in. And you realize that any one of these ministers can be the lead at any one point, depending on what the Lord is doing. But you only want one person that's always leading that. So you've got to have a person. They've got to be sensitive to other, everybody else in the team. And they've got to be able to bring them in and step aside when God is working that way. This is standard prayer things. And I'm hoping that you all know how to do this. But working as a team is critical in the type of force that we're dealing with. So you, because there's a lot more discernment. Any guy that's ever tried to cast out a Jezebel spirit out of a woman by himself knows not a good idea. Not a good idea. So when I go into ministry, I usually, so you say, crunch it up a little bit. I move the, the lead and the subject come right together because you want to be able to have a direct connection. Because once you move into the ministry position, you're establishing, you've already established the dominion and the situation around it and the authority of it. Now you're moving in to the situation and you're going to connect directly to the person and to the spirit at the same time. So you and this is you got to know the difference, because in the Old Testament, there was no difference. Right. You I mean the people got killed because they're. But in the New Testament, there's a separation 
If I cast out spirits by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come. I've separated the sin from the person. So that's an important concept here. Because when you're dealing with the person, you're now realizing that I'm dealing with a person, but I'm also dealing with the spirit. But when you're connecting, you're sort of connecting to both of them. And you've got to be able to do that. And we'll sort of, we're going to talk about this by going through some prayers. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to give you these. Now, does this mean that you should memorize these prayers? And the answer is no. What it means is I want you to look through these things and say, how do I handle that myself? And these are just examples that I use. And, and I, can, I probably have not done the same prayer twice because you just follow by the Spirit. But there's certain things that you sort of think about I want to be able to pray these things and be able to lead the person through them. Because there's a major difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant besides the fact that you can separate the sin from the person. And that's that when Jesus cast out demons, those people were not saved. There were, the Holy Spirit had not yet come. But now we have an ability to get them involved in the deliverance themselves Get them saved, get them empowered, because when you walk away, you want someone that's able to understand the situation and now has the power to deal with it. So it's not just a matter of casting out a demon anymore. It's empowering that person to understand the situation and to stand against that, that power, that darkness. So you want to include them in this discussion. That's why you've got, they've got to be saved and he says, you must be born again. So this is a simple prayer. Like, Father, I want to receive your promises and plan for my life. Now, I threw that in because you've got to establish the fact that God has a purpose for the person. And that person's got to believe that there's something on the other side of this. That it's not just, I'm, I need to come out of the pit, but I have a destiny to fulfill. And it's a good destiny and a good plan. And God's got that for you. That's why we had prophecy listed back in the discussion. Because if a person doesn't know, we're supposed to be able to tell them and speak life into them and a destiny into them and bring out what their purpose is. There's a really lack of purpose out there. Because people don't understand they've got a calling and a purpose and a destiny in God. And we've got to build that up in our discussion point so that now, if they haven't received that calling... They, need, they want the promises and plan, God's promises and plan for their life. I have sin in my life. In other words, that's what's blocking this thing. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me in the blood of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. Lord of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. You'd be surprised how that appeals to people. I thank you, Father, that my sins are forgiven. And I thank you that you have come into my heart and I'm saved. With the mouth you declare, with the heart you believe, right? So that's a simple prayer. And there's all sorts of ways that I'm sure each of you does it a different way. But this is just a way that I do it because I want to establish in them that God has a plan for their life. And it's better than the mess they're in right now. Even I'm talking about Christians even, that they need to understand that. And because there's something on the other side of where we are, we got to get to it. And that's so you definitely want to get that person saved. And you want to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Because if they don't, and you're out there dealing with demons, they're going to have problems the minute you leave the room. It doesn't take long. So they need to understand the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, once again, I've got a simple prayer for it, but I'd probably do it a little different than a lot of people because I don't focus on speaking in tongues because often that's a distraction to get people to try to speak in tongues because there's more to the, whole, the baptism of the Holy Spirit than speaking in tongues. As a matter of fact, it's been relegated to that. But, and don't get me wrong, speaking in tongues is important. Praying in tongues is very powerful. But there's more to it. So my prayer, Lord Jesus, I want the power to live my Christian life. So I ask you to baptize me with the Holy Spirit, just like on the day of Pentecost. 
Sometimes I'll throw in with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I receive all my spiritual gifts and all my callings that you have for me. So you're signing the bottom line here and say, I have a purpose and a destiny and I'm signing up for that. So you're, you're asking for your calling and for your spiritual gifts. You're, you understand you're signing, you're joining up the army right there. That's what this is about. That's the important part to me of baptism in the Holy Spirit. I claim the destiny you have ordained for me that I might serve you and build your kingdom. It's not about me. It's about you. Salvation may be about me, but baptism in the Holy Spirit is about you. Thank you, Jesus. I believe and receive your plan for my life once again. I'm signing up for whatever you want to do, God. And so this to me is what you've got to do to set up the situation because we want to bring that person into the situation of being able to stand on their own. Now I have other prayers, renouncing and repenting. These are examples of you, you want to be able to renounce something. You understand renouncing and repenting are different. Renouncing, you're basically saying, I know it's wrong and I'm, I'm acknowledging that. It's a sin. Because if it's a sin, then you've got the power of the, the blood of Jesus to be free from it. If it's not a sin, hey, it's just your choice. But you've got to acknowledge it. And you've got to renounce it. And that's just what I've got here in this prayer. And I'll just read through it real quick. Father, I know it's wrong. And I renounce my uh, addiction to alcohol. And I call all of my desire for this null and void. I ask you to cancel any curses, heal any hurts, and repair any damage I might have done. Please forgive me for my addiction to alcohol and my drinking. In the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask you to take away any desire to drink again. I choose to never get drunk again. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. So uh, it's a renouncing and a repenting. So you lead. Now, these are prayers that you're going to lead them with. They need to speak these things out. Now, if they can speak them out, let them do it on their own. Let them use their own words. But if you can prompt them, be able to do that. Lead them through the process and let them own this. But you've got to find a way to get them through it. And if you're just standing there going through it with them, that's fine. You want to forgive. You want to forgive, and people do not understand what forgiveness means. If you got a story and you say, I forgive this, then that story is gone. It's no more. You can't use it again. That's it. It's dead. You understand? When you release that situation, you can't bring it up again. That's it. It's dead. It's gone. So forgiving is releasing the situation. You can turn it over to Jesus, but it's no more. I release it. Because you want to be forgiven. Well, if you want to be forgiven, you need to forgive the others. You need to release your debts as he, you need, as you ask him to forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are our debtors. So you need to be able to release those debts, whatever anybody owes you. I'm talking about accounts payable and accounts receivable. Because he owns the books. You just gave him the books. And that's what forgiveness is all about. And you're saying, I want the future. I'm giving up the past. I'm no longer using it as an excuse of anything. You need to break vows and curses. Vows are things that you may have vowed and you'd be surprised what a vow is. I'll never get married. I'll never this. I'll never that. Oh, yeah. That, you're making vows, folks. And you need to basically ask forgiveness for that and call them null and void. You need to deal with those. And those will come out in the discussion. He says, well, did you ever happen to, I just keep getting, did you ever say that, you know, after seeing your parents' situation that you're never going to get married? Hmm. Well, you just made a vow. And you want to be able to break curses. Curses can come from anybody. But, these, but curses can be broken by the blood of Jesus. And here's just simple prayers to be able to do that. 
So these things are what's, demons have a way. They got there somehow, folks. They came in through some door, and we're just looking at those doors and closing them. Because that's what's important here. It's not really as much to me getting the demon out as closing all the doors. Once you do that, <clears throat> he doesn't, he's got no place. You can throw him out. Now, this one's a little controversial, but I, but I found that the Lord has used this several times in breaking generational curses. And I go back to Nehemiah 9 where they, they ask forgiveness for what they did, and they ask forgiveness for the sins of their forefathers. And you say, well, why would that be? Because if you're carrying something, then you're looking at it and saying, this is affecting me now. And if this is affecting me now, then I've got a responsibility and I can get rid of it. If, if you're putting it on me, that means I own it. And now that I own it, I'm putting it under the blood of Jesus and it's done. If you look down at your, and you, we start talking to people and you look at the situation and you say, well, tell me about your mother. Or tell me about your father. And all of a sudden you find out these patterns are in their life. And you're saying, whoa, wait a minute. You've got a pattern going on here. And your kids are going to do the same pattern if we don't break this thing. So you have a right to own that thing. If it's coming down your family line, then let's own it right now. And if it's got a root, Lord, show us. If it doesn't, that's fine. We'll just break it anyway. <clears throat> but if the Lord shows you a root, then you want to be able to deal with it. And say, well, if I'm going to carry this thing, then I ask you, Lord, to forgive my sins and the sins of my forefathers for doing this. And cleanse our family line. Because I want this off my kids. You can do that. And then, of course, simple enough, cast, cast out demons. And a very simple prayer. Devil, I bind you and your power over Amy, whoever, by the power of the spirit of the living God and in the name of Jesus, you evil spirit of suicide, come out of her and go now. You take authority and you tell them exactly what to do and when. Now, the reason I don't put the, in Jesus' name and stuff on the end is I establish my authority. By the power invested in me by the state of Georgia, you know, I mean, you basically are establishing who you are. And under that authority, then you speak the command. And you tell them, no. No. You will not do that. And I can tell you plenty of stories where it's amazing that people... <laughs> basically thought that they could do something. And I just like, no, you're not. You have authority here, just like a police officer. No, you, no, you won't. <laughs> We're arresting you and you're going to jail. I mean, you have authority. And you need to stand on that authority. And then, Father, in the name of Jesus, I call forth your peace, your love, and joy to fill up, Amy, with a wellspring of your living water, your Holy Spirit, right now. That, that which is inside to come up and do the cleansing, like the woman at the well who, who needs that, that ever-living water rising up inside of her. And you call it forth to fill up that situation. But the, so the goal when you go through this is to get that person empowered. Now, I just want to walk through real quickly a simple method of casting out demons. First of all, you assure the person with love and explain what's going to happen to them. You got to talk to them. Okay, you know, Amy, understand this is what's going on right now. There's something troubling you. It's a spirit. And I'm going to be talking to the spirit, and then I'm talking to you, Amy. So I don't want you to be afraid because you want to connect directly with that person. You're going to look them straight in the eyes. You're going to grab them by the hands if you need to, and you're going to look straight in the situation and speak to this thing. And Amy's got to know that you're, you can talk to her and you can talk to the Spirit. So you're not yelling at her, you're not doing this, but you're saying, Amy, I'll be talking to this thing now. And when she realizes there's something else going on in her, she's saying, oh my God, this is real. There is a demon here. Yeah, there is. And if I'm going to talk to it, you're going to see it respond, and you're going to have the same authority to tell it no and to leave me now in Jesus' name. So you've got to make that connection. I look straight in the eyes. I have them look. If they won't look at me, I command them to look at me. And I mean, they'll pull every trick in the book. They'll, they'll start crying and whining. I say, shut up and look at me right now. And I, they'll, all of a sudden, it's amazing how quick those tears can stop. 
because they weren't real in the first place a lot of times. So I'm just telling you, this, there's emotions. These demons are tricky, and you've got to be able to establish it. You've got to make that connection direct to them. So you're looking directly at them. Let them open up completely. Open their eyes to you. You look straight into their soul, and you say, you, your job, Amy, is to open up and let me get rid of this thing. Let me speak to it. And I want you to agree with me and speak to it too. And you're looking at them and speaking directly to Amy, but you're also, you say, okay, I'm going to be talking to this thing now. And I'm going to look at this thing, you evil spirit of depression. Whatever it is, the spirit of death, if you've had an abortion, come out of her in Jesus' name. And come out right now. So all of these things you can deal with. But you need that direct connection. A lot of people stand up and think it's all about standing around and yelling at demons. I, you connect with a person and you connect right with that demon. You look straight in their eyes and say no. And they'll understand. Now they may be afraid, but you explain it to them. Lead them in a prayer of salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, if they can receive it at this point. Sometimes you've got to do deliverance before you can even get to that. Speak with authority, but you don't need to yell. Matter of fact, sometimes yelling just makes it worse. Just look right in and say, no, this is not going to happen. You will not do that. You just speak with authority. That's all. It's that simple. Don't, don't, no fuss. And if it starts to make a fuss, I think I've got that in here. Um, then tell it to shut up. Just no. You will not do that. You're not going to No, You're going to sit right down there and you're going to be real quiet right now. Because I'm talking to you and you will pay attention in Jesus' name. So you just take authority. It's that simple. Anyone who's got children knows that sometimes you've got to call them by name and speak directly to them. And, of course, demons are a little worse than that, unless you've got some really bad kids. I don't know. So you want to look them in the eyes, create a point of contact, bind the power of the devil. That's a legal agreement. I bind your power in the name of Jesus Christ by his blood and by the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot have dominion over her. I command you to leave now. You can cast the demon out in Jesus' name and have them cast it out too. As a matter of fact, you want them to do it. Tell it, to, Amy, now that you're baptized in the Spirit, I want you to tell it to leave. Now you're standing there like this. So you know the little kid that's over there you know, yelling at the, uh, the person and the father's standing behind him like this, you know, so that the kid thinks it's them. When in reality, it's because you're standing behind them. Well, that's what's going on here. You're standing there with authority, and that person is beginning to speak, and you're backing that authority. It's like all these law enforcement officers are standing there with their guns, and you're saying, uh, why don't you get over here into the car now? So there's a, you're backing them up as we speak. So you cast out the demon in the name of Jesus. They in agreement. If she has an emotional outburst, often it's the demon. Tell them to be quiet and come out. Keep your spirit open for words of knowledge because it's not just one spirit. You've got other things that you're dealing with. So listen. And remember, you've got a team here. So if, if you're dealing with one thing and someone over here has got something else, then you can have them come over, stand in there, and do the same thing. So it's wherever God, because God will move through the team. And each one may take a, a different spirit or a different situation, or a different route. So, depending on how this works, let God lead. If the condition is considered terminal, cast out the spirit of death, or if it's an abortion situation, because you've invited the spirit of death into your body. How many times have we seen that? If people need healing and couldn't figure out what's going on with their body, we find out they had an abortion and they didn't deal with it in the spirit, and asked their forgiveness and released it. And therefore, they invited the spirit of death in, and they didn't understand why they were having all these problems. I said, you don't have to live with that. We can deal with that right now. But it, there's, there's different spirits out there, and they're real. If, there's a, if it's a condition where someone is pronounced, well, you know, this is a fatal condition, you need to cast out the spirit of death. If you ever go in a hospital, you better be able to deal with the spirit of death because it's all over the place. And you go into a room and you say, nope, not in this room. So, yes, there is spirit of death. After deliverance of all demons has been completed, make sure that the person is saved and spirit-filled. Otherwise, if they come back and you just cast them all out and 
they go their merry way, and usually within usually within three days, is what I've found, um, they'll come back. That's why you give them a warning to stand, and that's why you prepare them and say you need to stand for three days. If you can stand for three days, you're good. That's what I found. For some reason, if the person can say no for three days and not accept a lie, not accept whatever it is that the demon's been telling them to do, their habits, their whatever, if they can stand against it for like three days, they can usually stay free. And if they fall, they can get back up, which is interesting. It's not like, well, if you fall, you're down again for the count. No, you're not. You, you're, now this time, you're going to get back up. And each time, it gets easier. So that's the simple method of casting out demons. Then, of course, you want to pray protection and cleansing, and that's what we're going to do right now. I claim protection for all those here. I command all demonic forces to leave this place and not return here now in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you and your angel host to cleanse us and this place of any and all presence of demonic forces and restore us by your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We good?